this English news bulletin on Ronahi TV. People Defense Units issued a statement about the latest attacks on Afrin region. According to the YPG statement, the attacks on Afrin carried out by the Islamic State of Al-Iraq and Asham are being organized by Saudi Arabia and Turkish intelligence. According to the APG statement, the large-scale attack on Efrin through gender S began on the 22nd of September and was carried out by the Islamic State. APG and APG forces met the assault with fierce resistance and forced them to withdraw. The attacks on Castel and Yazaba were repelled by APG fighter and the Islamic State and its allies suffered heavy losses. In order to develop a new plan under the leadership of Saudi Arabia, a meeting took place in Riyadh between members of Turkish intelligence and the Saudi intelligence minister Bender bin Sultan. The sides agreed on that FSA and the Islamic State will attack Afrin. At this meeting, a man named Zehran Alush were assigned the task of overseeing the operation and was sent to Azaz. A meeting was held in Azad in which members of ISIS, Liwa El Tawhid and Turkish intelligence participated. Plans were developed for an attack on Efrin and the agreement was made to prevent the fighting among the different groups. As part of this agreement and in order to put the plan into operation, economic and military aid was provided by Turkey. The statement went on to mention that in the first wave of fighting that followed the renewed attack on Efrin that began on October 27th, 86 assailants were killed in three days. Kurdistan Communities Union Executive Council Co-President Jamil Baik has put three conditions in order to continue the democratic resolution process, which Kurdish leader Ojalan and Kurdish Communities Union ended on 15th of October. The Kurdistan Communities Union Executive Council Co-President Jamil Baik has put the following three conditions in order to continue the democratic resolution process. Improvement of Kurdish leader Abdullah Öcalan's condition in prison, a change in legal arrangements, the participation of a third party in the negotiations. Bayek remarked that the democratic resolution process was initiated by Öcalan and advanced by the unilateral steps of the Kurdish side. Bayek pointed out that the AKP government has on the other hand taken no steps intended for a solution and wanted to break the will of the Kurdish people by following policies deepening the war in the country. By express that the talks between Erjalan and the state's delegation should have advanced to negotiations as of 1st of June, as had been agreed by the state delegation as well. He noted that the government has halted the peace process and paid no attention to the Kurdish side's warnings that the process would be facing a deadlock under the current circumstances. The process has ended in the current state of affairs and it is the AKP government itself that has brought the process to an end, Bayek added. Bayek also criticized the government for providing no information about their intention concerning the course of the process. The Turkish government did not present a roadmap for a solution to the Kurdish question. This indicates that there are no serious intentions by the Turkish government to come up with a solution. The government's current attitude has to change before a negotiation process starts. The government's failure to take these urgent and essential steps would mean that the process has ended by the AKP government. Reactions are growing over the world. Turkey has recently started to build on northern Kurdistan Rojava border. The Kurdish people and politicians in two parts of Kurdistan condemn the war. Nusaybin Mayor Ayşe Gökhan, who started a protest on northern Kurdistan, Nusaybin border with Kamishloz Rojava, has turned her protest into a death fest. Gökhan told the press during her death fest on the border that Kurds have cleared the border region of mines with their own bodies. Not accepting the borders put between each other, people have been crossing these borders for nearly half century today. This is an inhuman situation that the Kurdish people never accept. Istanbul deputy of the People's Democratic Party, HDP Levent Tuzel, pointed out at the Congress held in Ankara that their primary duty will be demolishing the walls being built by Turkey between northern Kurdistan and Rojava. While BDP deputy co-chair Yüksel Mutlu stated that the AKP government is trying to separate Kurds from each other by building walls, 
would look compare the walls being built with the Berlin Wall and stressed that they will not accept the Turkish government attitude. BDP Youth Assembly spokesperson Ibrahim Karama also commented on the construction of the border walls by saying the Kurdish youth were determined to demolish the walls. The youth will not leave the border area until the wall construction is ended. On the other hand, BDP scheduled on 7th of November a mass protest march to northern Kurdistan Rojava border. The march will protest the wall being built and people of northern Kurdistan will also march in solidarity with Rojava revolution. In Rojava, the Revolutionary Youth Movement and the Confederation of the Patriotic Kurdish Students organized a march to Ikidam village of Efrin, where the wall is being built. Despite soldiers' presence at the border side of northern Kurdistan and the presence of mines, the protesters continued their march. Turkey's growing concern about formation of an autonomous entity in Rojava have prompted the AKP government to implement hostile policies against Kurds. We will discuss these Turkish policies with Jürgen Kluter, the European United Left Nordi Green Parliament member and coordinator of the Kurdish Friendship Group in the European Parliament, who will join us now uh, live from Berlin. Uh, we are pleased, uh, Mr. Jürgen, to have you on Ronahi TV. Um, in spite of all attempts by Turkey to foil the Kurdish um, uh, movement in Rojava, the people of Rojava are um, resisting. What is your assessment of Turkish policies on Rojava? Yes, uh, my impression is that the Kurdish government uh, is afraid that uh, the Kurdish movement uh, could become too strong. If you look to northern Iraq, to South Kurdistan, uh, there is uh, um, own um, administration and more or less uh, Kurdish state established. Uh, similar movements are started now in, in uh, uh, Rojava and uh, from my point of view the Turkish government uh, feared, is afraid that uh, the Kurdish movements, the Kurdish groups inside uh, Turkey could be encouraged to do the same. But from my point of view this kind of policy is a wrong one. They should uh, offer some uh, some, some more step, uh, the, the Turkish government should be more open uh, to Erdogan and to the PKK uh, mm -hmm. to come to a, to a quick uh, resolution in Turkey that could be a better step than to fight uh, the Kurdish uh, citizens in, in uh, Rojava. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kluter, how far can Turkey go in antagonizing Kurds in Rojava in your opinion? Um, yes, I, it's, it's a little bit difficult to answer from my point of view. Uh, it depends uh, on that, uh, what, what's the main uh, political powers, uh, the USA, the European uh, Union and Russia will accept and allow them to do. What kind of role can EU Parliament play here to stop these Turkish policies? Uh, yes, you have to consider that the European Parliament uh, in this issue uh, has not a main rule and uh, the, the main rule is with uh, Mrs. Uh, Ashton, uh, with the uh, external uh, service of the EU and with the Council. Uh, the Parliament only can, can follow the development in uh, Syria and in the Middle East uh, and uh, we can comment that uh, and we can try to push the Council and the Commission uh, to do a good work, mm -hmm. but uh, the, the possibility of the power of the parliament in this issue is really limited. In your condolences uh, letter to um, um, to the co-chair um, of PYD, Mr. Salah Muslim, um, you mentioned that EU governments should urgently um, realize that Al-Qaeda uh, affiliated groups are terrorizing the Kurds in Rojava. Um, does that mean, Mr. Kluter, that uh, the EU governments are not aware of this um, uh, danger um, the Kurds in Rojava are facing? Well, yeah, I sent this uh, condolation uh, message uh, some, some weeks ago, and uh, meanwhile, uh, I think the, the governments in the EU recognized uh, that, uh, especially uh, Musra, is a part of the um, uh, of the coalition and mm -hmm. they became a little bit more careful to deal with them but they need some time and uh, 
sometimes it's very difficult uh, to, to get a good uh, and, and uh, uh, correct analysis of the situation in, in Syria because uh, every day the situation is, is moving. And uh, but, but meanwhile, I'm sure that uh, that is recognized, uh, and the governments uh, uh, changed a little bit their their, their policy. And, mm -hmm. uh, I'm unsure that, uh, that now it's clear. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to something else. Um, many Kurds in Rojava are seeing Geneva Conference uh, as a chance to get their rights and get an international recognition of their existence in Syria. Uh, in your opinion, how can Kurds take advantage of this conference, uh, Mr. Kluter? Uh, that's, that's not so, so easy to, to give an answer. Um, in, in general, uh, myself and my party are in favor of a political solution. I think uh, every political uh, effort is better than, than an armed conflict and we have to overcome the armed conflict. And in this sense, uh, we agree this, uh, this efforts uh, to have this uh, conference, but it's difficult to say uh, what, what, the Kurdish, uh, what the best way for the Kurdish side uh, would be to, to deal with, with this uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, Yes. Alongside with the Syrian regime and the Arabic-Syrian opposition, Kurds succeeded uh, to be the third power in uh, Syria. Uh, going back here to the Geneva Conference, what kind of participation will serve the Kurdish issue in Syria? I think the one hand it would be good uh, that uh, Kurds will go uh, on, on their own ticket to, to this mm -hmm. conference. Uh, only in this way they can show their role, their special role, uh, and, and their demands, uh, especially the demands of, uh, of um, peace, uh, peace um, proposals um, and the roadmap uh, Achalan uh, proposed and, and uh, published uh, in, in March uh, this year. Mm -hmm. uh, that, from my point of view, could only be done uh, if, if the Kurdish side goes uh, on their own ticket. On the other side, uh, it will weaken the opposition to, to Assad, and that has to, to be um, uh, really good estimated. And on the other hand, mm -hmm. uh, from my point of view, it would have been better if the Kurdish, uh, if the Kurds had had their Erdogan conference already. You remember, it should. Uh, it, it was planned for, for August already, mm -hmm. but it, uh, now it should happen to, uh, in, in November only, mm -hmm. uh, because it is necessary that the Kurdish side uh, make some, uh, ha have some, some discussion and, and uh, it's necessary to de develop a common strategy. Mm -hmm. and therefore, if it, it, would be it, it would have been better to have this conference before. That's my, my point mm -hmm. of view. You are uh, a coordinator of the Kurdish Friendship Group in the European Parliament. Tell us more about this. Yes, we um, established this uh, Kurdish Friendship Group at the beginning of 2010, a group uh, with members from all politi uh, political groups in the Parliament, or nearly all, not from the fascist side, but uh, from, from the other uh, political groups. We have members, and uh, our main task is to inform the parliament about the development uh, in the Kurdish region, uh, to have some exchange with uh, Kurdish politicians. Uh, sometimes we invite uh, people like Leila Sana or uh, Salah bin Benatash. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, sometimes we organize in some, uh, some common press releases uh, to push uh, uh, or to, to, to forward some, some uh, special information. Mr. Jürgen Kluter, the European United Left Nordic Green Parliament member and coordinator of the Kurdish Friendship Group in European Parliament, you've been with us from Berlin. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, interview and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Tulkocher city, what, which was liberated by people defense units and women defense units, Yepage, on 26 of October is deemed as a strategic gain for the Kurds and will enlighten the embargo imposed on Rojava. Tulkocher city, or al yarubiya city in Arabic, is located in Rojava, 60 kilometers away from Derik city and 90 kilometers from Qamshu city. Tulkocher al yarubiya is the main border crossing between Rojava and Iraq. Located to the northwest of Baghdad and is known from the Iraqi side as Rabi'iyah Crossing. 
Al Walid Abu Kamal and Tel Kocher border crossings are the three main crossing points between Syria and Iraq. The Islamic State, Al Nusra Front, and some battalions of the Free Syrian Army took control of Tel Kocher city from the Syrian regime on 21st of July 2012. After the armed groups controlled Tel Kocher Al Yarubiya city, it turned to a main center for the armed groups to attack Rojava and its people. This prompted People Defense Unit Yepage and Women Defense Unit Yepage to launch an offensive to liberate the city. After fierce clashes between Yepage and Yepage fighters with the Islamic State and Al Nusra Front, the Kurdish fighters took control of the city on 26th of October. Border control of Tel Kocher is of critical importance for the people of Rojava. With the liberation of Tel Kocher border crossing, the embargo on Rojava will be lightened. After the liberation of Tel Kocher city, celebrations were held in various parts of Rojava. In addition, international media outlets paid attention to the event. Citizens of Kamashlo City celebrated the victory of People Defense Units and Women Defense Units in Tel Kocher City. <laughs> While in Derek City, thousands of citizens from all components marched to celebrate the liberation of Tel Kocher City from radical Islamist groups. Citizens of Terbes Pia Town also expressed their joy of the liberation of Tel Kocher border crossing. We are very happy with liberating Tel Kocher city. We hope all the Kurdish areas and Syria will be liberated from these terrorist groups. Everybody is happy with this victory. Arabs, Kurds, Assyrians and Armenians. We all will do our best on strengthening the ties of the brotherhood between the people of Rojava. We congratulate Tepege and Tepege victory in Tel Kocher. It is a big victory of the people of Rojava. We hope that Yepege and Yepege fighters continue their operation in liberating our areas from these terrorist groups. International news media outlets paid wide attention to the liberation of Tel Kocher border crossing from Al-Qaeda link groups. Reuters news agency titled the news with Kurdish fighters see Syrian border posts from Islamists. BBC titled the news with Syria Kurdish fighters seize border posts from Islamists. Sky News titled the news with Kurds rule jihadist on Iraq border. While Al Jazeera English highlighted the news with Syrian Kurds capture border posts with Iraq. The Japan Times said Syrian Kurds rule jihadists at major border crossing with Iraq. Washington Post said Syrian Kurdish fighters capture border crossing with Iraq from Al-Qaeda link groups. While the English The Guardian titled the news of Tel Kocher liberation with Syrian Kurds capture border crossing with Iraq after intense fighting. Peace and Democracy Party BDP representative office in the United States of America organized on 28th of October the first Kurdish conference in Washington entitled The Role of Kurds in the New Middle East. Academics, experts and politicians from Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran and the United States discussed in a conference organized by Peace and Democracy Party on 28th of October the changing situation and the role of the Kurds in the Middle East with a particular focus on the developments in Turkey and Syria. The conference consisted of four panels, each of which addressed a different topic. The panels were the Kurds in a changing Middle East, the Imrali peace process, the U.S., Turkey and Kurds towards a new vision, the Kurds of Syria and their vision for the future with speakers, Alan Shammo, member of the Democratic Union Party Foreign Affairs Committee, Ambrin Zaman, Turkey correspondent for The Economist magazine, 
Saif Badr Khan representative of the Kurdistan National Congress in the United States of America, Kristen Sinclair, Assistant Director of Center for Middle Eastern Studies in the University of Arizona and the President of the Kurdish Studies Association. On his part, PYD's co-chair Salah Muslim joined the conference through Skype and reaffirmed his desire to establish relations with the United States to cooperate in building a democratic Syria. In this regard, the former U.S. ambassador to Turkey, James Jeffrey, hinted at the conference that Washington would be unwilling to meet with Muslim while the governments in Hawler and Ankara continue to object. Saif Badr Khan, the representative of the Kurdish National Council in the United States, spoke of the oppression of the Kurds under the Ba'ath regime and the role that PYD had played in organizing resistance. He added that Kurds had been treated like enemies and second-class citizens. He called on the United States and Turkey to understand that PYD was a significant actor in the conflict and that both powers needed to take this seriously. The visiting UN Arab League joint envoy to Syria, Al Akhtar Al Brahimi, said on Friday that both the Syrian government and the domestic opposition have agreed to attend the Geneva II conference to solve the Syrian crisis. In Geneva, one meeting on 13th of June 2012, major powers agreed on the principle of a political transition but failed to stop the war. The key aim of Geneva too would be to get all parties to agree on the principle of a political solution and then build on Kofi Annan's peace plan and the 13th June 2012 meeting. In early October 2013, the date for Geneva II conference was agreed by Russia and US to be mid-November 2013. The Assad government is ready to engage in Geneva II peace conference based on the right of the Syrian people to choose their political future and to reject all forms of intervention. The Syrian National Coalition refuses to partake in Geneva II peace conference as long as Assad does not vow on beforehand to stay out of the envisioned transitional government. Iran's President Hassan Rouhani says Tehran is ready to take part in the planned Geneva II conference on the Syrian crisis if invited without any preconditions. The Syrian National Council declared it would leave the coalition if the coalition took part in the peace talks. The Council said it would not negotiate before Assad left office. The National Coordination Body for the Democratic Change in Syria is backing a second Geneva Convention and stressing on the participation of the three main opposition blocs, the Syrian National Coalition, the National Coordination Body and the Supreme Kurdish Council. The Supreme Kurdish Council is backing any efforts aimed stopping the Syrian civil war and showed its readiness to represent the people of Rojava in Geneva II conference. The People Defense Units, which includes Women Defense Units, is willing to join the Geneva conference separately from the Supreme Kurdish Council in case the Free Syrian Army is participated separately. The Supreme Kurdish Council is seeking to participate in Geneva Conference separately as it believes that the Kurds of Rojava managed to be the third power in Syria and are the most organized one. This uh, Supreme Kurdish Council's demand is being supported by the people of Rojava. Aiming to secure the participation of Kurds separately in the International Geneva II Peace Conference, the Supreme Kurdish Council visited Moscow on 2nd of June and met Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Mikhail Bogdanov, and on 7th of June the Russian Parliament Duma officials. Previously, the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov emphasized in a press conference that Kurds should be included in the Syrian Peace Conference and said, we believe all opposition structures in Syria should be given an opportunity to communicate their viewpoints and participate in the achievement of a compromise, which will ensure peace, stability and equal rights for all ethnic and religious groups in the country. Among the organizations that want to take an independent part in the conference are the National Coordination Committee and the Supreme Kurdish Council. The Supreme Kurdish Council demand taking part in Geneva Conference is supported by the people of Rojava. We want Kurds to be presented in Geneva Conference in the Supreme Kurdish Council. 
We don't want the Kurdish political parties to go separately to Geneva or with the Arabic opposition who do not recognize our rights. The Supreme Kurdish Council is the only legitimate representative of Kurds. We want the Supreme Kurdish Council to be present in Geneva. The Council should demand recognition of the Kurdish existence in Rojava. The Geneva Conference should stop the attacks of terrorist groups on Rojava. We don't want these groups in our areas. Geneva Conference will be a chance for Kurds to obtain their rights. Association Dear Bakr branch has disclosed the 2030 report on human rights violation in eastern and southeastern Anatolia regions. Speaking at the press conference on the report, IHD Vice President Serdar Celebi put emphasis on the importance of the negotiations initiated this year between Kurdish leader Abdullah Öcalan and the Turkish state in search of a peaceful solution to the Kurdish question. Celebi remarked that there has been no deaths in clashes and a remarkable decrease in the number of right violations thanks to the democratic resolution process. Celebi said the IHD has concluded following investigations and examinations in the border area in the last three months that Turkey has supported the gang groups attacking Kurds in Rojava, closed its border gates and imposed embargo on the people of Rojava and built walls of shame in some areas with an aim to separate Kurdish people from each other. IHD Vice President remarked that Turkey's practices and policies against Rojava have drawn reaction and are having a negative influence on the peace process. Celebi called on the government to do its part in the peace process to end the isolation imposed on PKK leader Abdullah Öcalan and to provide him with necessary circumstances in order for the advancement of the dialogue and negotiations in the peace process. Let's move on now to the press review and the selection of what has been written about Syria and Rojava. The American International Business Times have paid attention to the Genova 2 talks and asked if the Kurds are the solution to the Syrian puzzle. Together with the Syrian opposition, Syrian Kurds are preparing themselves to take to the negotiating table. While their hope is to gain recognition of the historical northern Kurdish region of Rojava, deeper regional and international interests may currently be at stake. The Bloomberg News Agency highlighted the Kurdish issue in Middle East by saying the Kurds get a second chance in Syria. About the Kurds in Rojava, Bloomberg said, the Kurds can't erase all the hurts of their modern history and those who choose to stay in Syria remain embattled, yet the isolation that had been their lot is now in the past. At the foot of those once sheltering mountains, a new and a safer life has sprung forth. Bloomberg News Agency ended the article with saying, History has given the Kurds a second chance in Iraq and Syria, while Turkish democracy gives them a voice in the country's direction. Meadows are stagnant in Iran, where the oppression of the Kurds is of a piece with the tyranny of a theocracy. The Telegraph published an article about the Turkish support for the radical Islamist group by saying, hundreds of Al-Qaeda recruits are being kept in safe houses in southern Turkey before being smuggled over the border to wage jihad in Syria, the Daily Telegraph has learned. The Telegraph conveyed experts' growing fears over whether the Turkish authorities may have lost control of the movement of new Al-Qaeda recruits or may even be turning a blind eye. After the Iranian authorities carried out on 25th of October, 20 death sentences, including a Kurdish political prisoner, prisoner named Habibullah Gulparipur, Amnesty International warned that two more Kurdish death row prisoners from eastern Kurdistan are at risk of being executed. According to Hasiba Had Sahrawi, Middle East and North Africa Deputy Director at Amnesty International, the two Kurdish prisoners, Saniyar Muradi and Luqman Muradi, in Iranian prisons are on the death row and could be executed. Sahrawi added, These and all other executions must be halted immediately. While the Iranian authorities have a responsibility to bring those suspected of criminal offenses to justice, the death penalty should never be used as it is inhuman and degrading punishment. 
Zanyar Muradi and Lokman Muradi both urged Deathrow prisoners claim that they were tortured into confessing to the 2009 murder of the son of a senior cleric in Marivan, Kurdistan province. They were sentenced to death in December 2010 after being convicted of enmity against God and corruption on earth. They were also convicted of taking part in armed activities with Komala, a Kurdish opposition group which conducted armed struggle against the Islamic Republic of Iran. This international amnesty warning came after the execution of 20 prisoners on 25th of October, among them Habibullah Gulbaripur, for whom an amnesty international has campaigned. On the morning of 25th of October, Habibullah Gulparipur was transferred from solitary confinement in Umiya prison of Eastern Kurdistan to an unknown location and executed the same evening. His family was not notified beforehand. After his execution, the Iranian authorities have reportedly refused to hand over his body to his family. Habibullah Gulparipur was sentenced to death in a five-minute trial in March 2010. Through his alleged cooperation with the Party for Free Life of Kurdistan, Pajak, he had been arrested in September of the previous year in Eastern Kurdistan and convicted of enmity against God. He subsequently wrote a letter to Iran's Supreme Leader alleging he was tortured during interrogation, but these allegations were never investigated. That's all for this week. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.